Historically, archaeologists have made a great deal of use of something they call typology. Typologies are really classifications or sets of categories that allow us to sort artifacts and other things on a nominal scale. For example, you might classify pottery with categories like bowl, jar, cooking pot, juglet, and so on. Or we might have a more complex typology that characterizes pottery and other things as belonging to categories that we think are culturally or chronologically significant, such as bell beaker or Natufian lunate. In this video, I'll talk about some of the theory and methods that archaeologists use either to sort artifacts into categories or classes, or to group artifacts into groups. The technical term for the result of these processes is systematics. When archaeologists want to establish categories or nominal scales, they often turn to classification, which uses sets of rules or definitions that allow them to assign objects to categories, ideally in an unambiguous way sometimes by use of a, something like a decision tree, as you see here. One aspect of classification is that the artifacts are then sorted to the categories that you've previously established. We're going to demonstrate that here with a very simple classification, not a very realistic one, that's based on classification by size. So here I've made a simple sort of chart uh, that has three circles on it with diameters of 7.5 centimeters, 10 centimeters, and 15 centimeters. And we're going to use those to sort these bifacial velcolithic tools uh, into three categories, uh, small, medium, and large, essentially. So that's a very simple process when we have a chart like this, in that we uh, select each tool in turn, place it on the chart, and if it fits entirely within the 7.5 centimeter circle, that means we classify it as small. If it this one doesn't quite fit within the 10 centimeter circle, so that means it gets classified as large. This one fits between the 7.5 and 10 centimeter circle, so it gets classified as medium. And we can continue this process with each artifact in turn. And you can see it goes fairly quickly when we use a chart like this. If we're using a size as one of our criteria for our classification, this is a rather efficient way to sort the artifacts by size. Although we wouldn't often employ a simple unit, unidimensional classification like one based on small, medium, and large to analyze artifacts, it's not that uncommon to have a unidimensional classification that's a little bit more complex. Here, for example, we see Josef Garfinkel's classification of de uh, design motifs on Neolithic pottery from Israel. And he has uh, actually more than 16 categories of these things. And each of these categories are treated as completely separate from one another, even though we can see that some categories are more similar to one another than others are. So it might also be possible to break this down into something more complicated that treated the different attributes of these classes separately. For example, we might have a class that has pendant triangles or V-shapes from a horizontal band and then subdivide them on the basis of whether there are single or double triangles or whether the triangles are filled with, ha with hatch marks or herring bones or nothing. Now a more realistic classification would not just use one dimension like size but would use multiple dimensions. When we have two or three dimensions, it's fairly convenient to use a paradigmatic classification. So I'm going to demonstrate that with a very simple one, and we're going to still use size as one of, as one of, the, uh, one of the dimensions. So here I've set up the boxes for sorting a little bit differently in, in uh, two rows of three. So each column in my little grid here is going to represent a small, medium, and large in, in the uh, size dimension, and the other two the, the, the two different rows will represent different materials. Now most of the tools that I'm sorting here are made from a very poor quality material that's almost like limestone. It's got a very poor quality chert that's uh, very close to, which looks very similar to limestone and it has, tends to have a very orange patina. And then a few of them are made from much better quality flint. 
So just to keep things simple, I'm just going to sort them by size and two kinds of material. Ordinarily, archaeologists would have a lot more than two uh, categories of material, but here we're keeping it simple. So start with this one. This one, again, fits in the small size category, and it's also made of high-quality flint, so we'll put that here. Uh, this one uh, fits in the medium size category and is also made from high-quality flint. We'll put that here. This one is just barely squeaks into the small category, but it's made from the poorer quality material, so we'll put it here. This one is medium and poor quality, so it goes there. This one is small and poor quality, so it goes there. This one is large but poor quality, so it goes there. This one, it's a bit of a judgment call, but uh, I guess we'll call it poor quality. And it is maximum length. It's almost exactly 10 centimeters. So in cases like this, you have to have a rule. When something appears to be exactly 10 centimeters, does that put it above or below the 10 centimeter mark? And let's say that our rule is that the large category is 10 centimeters or greater. So that would make that in the large category. And then this one would be it's slightly over 7.5 centimeters, so it's in the medium category. So at the end of the classification, or at the end of the sorting process, we would have our tools uh, deposited in various trays here on the table. And we'll note that some of the trays at the end of this process would be quite full, and other trays would have very few artifacts in them because the high quality material is quite rare at this site. And you'll notice that none of the large, we have no examples of large, uh, high quality tools. This time, we're going to try to sort the exact same artifacts using a somewhat more complex kind of classification, a taxonomic one. That's a classification that has, has hierarchy in it. At the top of the hierarchy, we're going to divide the tools into two groups, ones that are pointed on at least one end and ones that are not pointed on either end. And then for the ones that are not pointed, we're going to divide them into three categories, ones that are triangular in cross-section, ones that are plano convex in cross-section, which means they're kind of humped on one side and kind of flat on the other side, and ones that are convex on both sides, or bifacial essentially. For the triangular ones, we're going to then sort them into only two groups, ones that are triangular in cross-section and ones that are not. Okay, let's see how that goes now. So we'll take this one. Uh, this one has, is not pointed at either end. Now one of the first things we'll notice with a, with a set of rules like this, which is why you need to think classifications through very carefully, is that many of these tools are broken, in which case uh, it's difficult to know whether or not they're pointed at either end or not. So in that case, we might need yet another category for ones that are broken tools that you can't classify in this, in this sense. So we'll put those over there. Uh, this one is not pointed at either end. It is plano convex in the cross section. So plano convex, I think I said, goes in this one. Uh, this one is not pointed at either end. It is also plano convex. So it goes here. This one, one could argue, is pointed at one end. And again, if you're making a set of rules like this, you have to be very careful about what you mean by pointed. Like how sharp a point does it have to be? This one's a little bit rounded at the end. But one could make the argument that it, because it narrows quite a bit, that it makes it pointed. So it means it's going to be on this side of our classification. And it is kind of, well, it's, not, it's definitely not triangular in cross section. So we'll put that, put that there. Let's look at this one. This one is pretty clearly pointed uh, at one end. So it's going to go over on this side of the classification. And it also has a triangular cross section. I'm not sure how clearly you can see that. So it's going to go there. Um, this one is broken, so it goes there. This one is not pointed at either end, and it is I guess you would say that was plano convex, so it's going to go here. This one, kind of like that one, it's one could argue that it's pointed at one end, even though it's not a very sharp point. And it is definitely plano convex rather than triangular, so it would go 
we go over here. And we can continue on through all of these, and we see this one's not pointed, and it is uh, convex on both surfaces. So we would go here, and we continue the process uh, accordingly. This one is not pointed at either end, and it's actually kind of triangular in cross section. Yeah, so that would go here. So when we finish, we'll have a number of things sorted here, but the, it's hierarchical because we first looked at whether they were pointed or not before we started to look at other things. Now in this case, I used uh, categories lower in the hierarchy that are pretty similar in the two branches of the classification, but that's not necessarily the case. That, that doesn't have to be the case. And you'll notice at least we had three categories or subcategories here and only two over here, but they still had to do with cross-section, but they wouldn't have to. We could have had cross-section over here as being the important criterion for subdivision, and on this side use some other kind of criterion, such as uh, the, whether the two ends of the tool, except for another broken one, whether the two ends of the tool um, were similar, for example, both being adds like uh, or chisel like uh, cutting edges, or whether the cutting edge was only at one end and the other end was not, was not used as a cutting edge. That would have been, made it possible to have different kinds of criteria in one branch of the classification than another. And that's one of the advantages of using a taxonomic classification. You don't have to uh, use the same criteria throughout the classification. You can use ones that make sense. You know, for example, with stone tools, or lithics in general, uh, there's no point in looking at unretouched flakes the same way you would look at a fully retouched tool. So you know, the criteria you would use to subdivide the tools are going to be quite naturally quite a bit different than the ones you'd use to subdivide unretouched flakes. So that's why taxonomies are actually quite useful in archaeological classification. This diagram summarizes the hierarchical arrangement of the taxonomy we just used to classify those bifacial tools. We'll now try to do a taxonomic classification using pottery, including some pottery that has that decoration on it. Again, there's no set rule about how to do this, but you do need to set up some kind of, some kind of rule for your classification, and this is going to be a very hierarchical one in the, with very different kinds of criteria in each branch of the tree, as it were. So at the top here, we have a, a group of sherds that I've laid out, some of which are decorated, some are not. So we're going to start out at the top of our tree by setting aside sherds that have no surface treatment at all, uh, over in this box. Here we're going to put sherds that have, well, whose only surface treatment is a, is, a, is a slip, so there's no design on it. And then initially, in the, the, all the rest are ones that have some kind of painted design. Uh, here we'll use the term paint uh, quite loosely because, as, we, as we'll see in, in later videos, designs on pottery aren't necessarily made with paint. They're sometimes made with slip or something else. So all the rest is painted, and then we're going to subdivide the painted sherds into ones that have only a simple band of paint on them, could be a wide or narrow band and nothing else, and then others that have multiple lines of some kind on them. And then we'll further subdivide the multiple line ones into categories, including sherds that go over here that have wiggly lines on them. If they have at least one wiggly line, they go in this category. And if they don't have any wiggly lines, they get shunted off to another part of the tree where they are then divided into ones that have either parallel lines or alternating groups of lines or cross-hatching. Finally, among the parallel line ones, we'll distinguish ones that only have horizontal lines from ones that have at least some diagonal lines. All right, so that's a little bit clearer from the figure, but let's now uh, run through some shirts that are here and see what we come up with. So I'll just, you know, arbitrarily pick one. Uh, this one seems to have, it is painted, so it goes in the painted category. It has no wiggly lines. It does have multiple lines that include since there's the rim, it includes at least some diagonal line. It has no hatching, no alternating, but it does have diagonal lines on it, so it's going to go here. This one has nothing on it except a kind of a sloppy slip, so it's going to go in this category. This one similarly has no decoration on it and just has a sloppy slip, so we'll put it here. This one is completely undecorated, so we'll put it here. Same goes with this one. No, no surface treatment at all, so it goes over here. This one also has no surface treatment, so it goes here. Now this one 
has hatching and parallel lines on it. So it's very important for us to go down the tree, starting at the top and working our way down to make sure we classify it correctly. So following down through here, we know it's, it's, it's painted, it has multiple lines, none of the lines are wiggly, so it's going to get shunted over into this part of the tree, um, and it has hatching on it, it has cross hatching on it. And the way we're defining the cross hatching category is if it has any cross hatching on it at all, it goes into that category. So even though this one does also have parallel horizontal lines, we're going to put it in the cross hatching category. But it's very important you have to have a rule that makes it clear that that's where it's supposed to go. It's not enough just to say that it could have cross hatching on it. it you have to make it that it, it, any ones that have cross hatching go in this category. Or you make a different rule, in which case it might end up, if, if it turns out that parallel lines trump cross hatching, it would get shifted over to this side. But here I'm going to have a rule that any cross hatching at all requires us to put it in that category. Same goes with uh, this one. This one has other things going on too, like burnish, but burnish isn't mentioned in our classification. But it is, uh, it had, it is obviously decorated. It has multiple lines, and in this case, the lines are cross-hatched, so it belongs in this category. Also, this one uh, has decoration. Uh, it's not just a simple band, and it has wiggly lines. Or it has at least one wiggly line on it, so it will go here. This one is decorated. Uh, it has multiple lines. Uh, they happen to be parallel lines, and they happen to be diagonal. So it's going to go. That's a bit too big for this category, for this box. But I'll put it. I'll put it here below the box. Uh, this one again is decorated with multiple lines. It does have some straight parallel uh, horizontal lines on it, but it also has cross hatching. So it's going to go in this category. This shirt. This shirt has. Uh, multiple lines, it's decorated, has multiple lines, and the lines are in alternating groups. So one is diagonal this way, one is diagonal that way, it belongs in this category. This shirt is decorated, has multiple lines, and the lines are, there's the rim there, so the lines are actually diagonal. So again, it's going to go in this category. This shirt is decorated, but its only decoration is a simple uh, horizontal band. So it's going to go in that category. This one is decorated, um, and it has wiggly lines. It has, it has multiple lines, and, there, and two of them at least are wiggly. So it's going to go in this category. This one is decorated, but its only decoration is a simple band on the rim. So it belongs in this category. This one, similarly, it's decorated, but only with a single band on the interior and exterior of the rim, so it also goes in this category. This one is undecorated and has no slip, so it goes over here. Uh, this one is undecorated, but it has a sloppy kind of slip on it, so it goes here. And finally, this one is decorated. It has multiple lines. There's one on the band, there are two here. And it looks like this one is a wiggly line, so it's going to go in this category. So we're done. So you'll notice the significant thing about this particular taxonomy is that different branches of the taxonomy had different criteria. Like we didn't subdivide uh, the banded, the ones with a single band, into you know um, alternating or uh, hatching or anything like that because it would be silly to do that because they can't possibly be hatched if they only have a single line on them. So you, it makes sense that different branches of a taxonomy should have different criteria. Classifications are abstract because their categories don't consist of things, but rather of definitions or rules that are designed to make the classes mutually exclusive. The rules define the conditions that an artifact must satisfy in order to be assigned to a class, and as long as it satisfies those rules, nothing else matters. However, the two main kinds of classification, paradigmatic and taxonomic, differ in the way those rules are applied. In paradigms, classes are defined by the intersection of dimensions, each dimension itself being a unidimensional classification of sorts, such as size, color, or decoration type. This makes it easy to assign artifacts pretty unambiguously, but can be inefficient, because it can result in a lot of empty categories. On the other hand, taxonomies are very efficient because they use hierarchy to define classes by distinctions, and the subdivisions in each branch of the taxonomy don't have to be the same.
Consequently, you don't have to include any classes that are unlikely to be useful. When sorting artifacts, archaeologists don't always use classification. Sometimes they use what we could call grouping methods. At the simplest level, this can be a very intuitive kind of grouping where we just look at the artifacts and kind of push into the same pile artifacts that look similar to each other by shape, color, whatever the case may be. Quite often we're going to be influenced in doing this by preconceptions about what kinds of attributes might be important, but we might change our minds about those attributes as we go along. So if again we want to sort these same uh, stone tools that uh, we used for the classification earlier, you know, I would examine it and get some idea what it looks like and place it somewhere on a table. And then I pick up a next one, the next one, I'd say, well, that doesn't look very much like that one at all, so I'll put that one over here. And uh, keep on doing this until I have the artifacts sorted into what I think are groupings that are fairly similar to each other. This one's kind of like that, but maybe not quite. Here. Now this method tends to be rather subjective, and we're not being very explicit about what things are influencing us to put things in particular groupings. Sometimes we might change our mind. Once we have more groupings made, we might say, well, maybe this is fairly similar to those ones after all. And then when we examine these, we might change our mind about some, some things. And we might decide that these two groupings aren't all that different from each other, and we decide to combine them into one group. might decide that this one doesn't belong in that group after all, but maybe it belongs, on second thought, in this group. So at the end of the process, we end up with several groupings of artifacts that we think are grouped together on the basis of similarity, but we haven't defined in any specific way in what ways they're similar. We might subconsciously be doing that, like why was probably influenced by the shape of the cutting edge, and whether or not there were cutting edges at only one end of the tool or at both ends of the tool, but they weren't very formally uh, built into my decisions about where to put things the, same, the way they would be if it, we were using a classification. So what can we say about the groups that result from this kind of sorting? One thing we can say is that we don't have any explicit definition for what causes certain artifacts to be in certain groups. It is all very intuitive uh, and we can't actually say that there's any rule that defines why this tool, for example, is a member of this group and not, say, this group or this group. There's no specific rule for that. At best, there's kind of tendencies. We might be able to summarize the characteristics of the tools in a particular group and say, well, they tend to be within a certain size range, they tend to be a, a little bit pointed at one end, they tend to have a, a fairly broad cutting edge at at least one end. So we can, but there are tendencies, and not all of them have that. So some, some of them are similar in that way, and some are similar in other ways. So the ways in which they're similar to each other are not necessarily the same as they would be in a proper classification. So that is a bit of a problem. And one of the things that is a result of that is that we can describe what's in this group, but we can't make any kind of rules that would define uh, the group. So we can de describe it simply by listing all the artifacts that belong to the group, 
or we can try to you know, do some kind of statistical measurements that would kind of summarize certain characteristics of them. So that on average, they tend to be a certain size, on average, they tend to be a certain thickness, on average, they tend to be a certain shape, and so on. But we can't say that any particular tool in this group will have any particular size, shape, or whatever. Another thing we can say about these groups is that any time that we add or subtract artifacts we have to re-describe re the groups. So if I were to get another box of artifacts and start trying to add them to this group, these groups, I'd probably find some that don't really fit very well with any of these groups, so I'd have to make a new group. And then once I make that new group, I might decide, well, really, maybe this one actually doesn't really belong in this group, it belongs in the new group. So it, the, the contents of the groups are very sensitive to additions or subtractions of material. As soon as we add or subtract any artifacts, we pretty much have to go back to square one and redefine the groups. And that's because there are no rules to define what belongs in what group. And things that look similar to each other at one level, when we have certain, you know, when we have, I don't know, about 40 artifacts here, uh, might not seem so similar when we have more artifacts and more variety in the collection. Now one type of grouping method is similar to the last one in some respects in that there's a fair degree of intuition involved, um, but it's also a little bit more formal. And that's sometimes called the type variety method. Like that previous method, it's kind of a method based on central tendency. At the end of the day, we're hoping that the objects we've assigned to a particular group are more similar to each other than they are to members of other groups. But in this case, we do it by a more formal kind of matching procedure. So it's quite commonly used for things like uh, flint types and uh, fabric types in pottery. And the idea is, let's say for pottery, is that we would have uh, ideal examples of each fabric type for the pottery. And recognizing that no two shirts, or at least no two vessels, are likely to have exactly the same fabric, uh, we try to match each shirt up with the ideal types to find the one that seems to fit the best. So we don't expect them to be exactly the same, but they, we expect a strong degree of similarity, and at least more similarity to one type than to some of the other types in our type system. Now here I've set it up for types of flint. So we have here five categories of flint of varying color and uh, quality and so on. Uh, some are a bit waxy looking, for example. We have a black one and kind of a grayish brown one, a darker gray one. This is that poor quality stuff that we used from some of the previous examples. And here's a very poor quality gray uh, chert. So we don't expect any of the artifacts over here to match exactly with those, but we'll see how, they, how well they do match up. So we just go through them. And obviously this doesn't look like it's a good match to that. It could be somewhere in this range. It's better quality than that one. And I, it looks to me like it probably is the best match to this one here. So we'll assign it there. Uh, set that one aside for a minute. This one pretty clearly belongs with this one. This one's pretty good quality. A little bit pinkish. None of these are particularly pinkish. It's kind of pinkish or purplish. But it probably fits best with this one. In, in fact, it actually fits probably best with this, which we've already assigned to this group. So let's put it there. Uh, same goes with this one, I think. It probably is the best fit to this one. Again, it looks similar to that. Um, this one is probably most similar to this one. But, you know, it's a bit of a judgment call because none of these are going to be exactly similar to any of our types, our type examples. This one's pretty clearly in that group. This one... It's fairly poor quality. It's poorer quality than that, but not as poor as that. The color is kind of in the range of these two. It's pretty clearly not that or that. I think the closest we can come is this, even though it's not a very close match. Uh, same goes with this, potentially. Bit of a judgment call as to whether this belongs with this, this type or this type. I'm going to assign it to this one on the grounds that it has this little bit of brown around the edges. And that would be the same for this one. Even though in some respects it looks like a good match to that, I'm going to assign it to this group. This one pretty clearly belongs to this group, as does this one. 
a good match to our example there. Um, this one is a bit ambiguous because on the one hand it has a big black chunk here, which is a very good match for this, but the remainder of it seems to be a better match for this. So it's a bit of a judgment call where we put something like that. It might imply that these types we've set up are not good ones, uh, but if we're going to stick with that, we have to make a decision. And for now, maybe just because most of it seems to be like that, we'll put it in this group. But at some later date, we might change our mind and move it over to there once we get more things in the group. Uh, this one pretty clearly belongs with that, I should think. This one belongs with that, as does that. This one is very poor quality gray shirt that's a good match for that, so it goes over here. And then finally, we have one more of these black ones, so it goes there. So we now have them sorted into separate groups, and we can't claim that any of these objects in the same group are 100% similar to each other or to the type example up at the top, but we can try to claim, at least, that they're more similar to each other than they are to the members of the other groups. And that's the main objective of this kind of uh, grouping system. Another method for grouping is a little bit more formal still. In this case, we have kind of like rules that are associated with each type, but they're a little bit more flexible than the kinds of rules we have in classifications. What I mean by that, we might have seven or eight characteristics that we associate with a particular type, like this grayish flint here. But the difference is we don't expect every flake that's assigned to this type to have all seven or eight of those attributes. We only expect it to have some fairly high uh, percentage of those uh, attributes. So, you know, among the attributes, we might say that the color has to be in a certain range from, uh, in this case, gray. Uh, we might say that there should be some glossiness or waxiness to the surface. We might uh, say that it should have uh, some fossil include some very small fossil inclusions in it. Uh, we might say that it has certain fracture characteristics, so on and so on. But then we don't expect every single example of this type to exhibit all of those attributes, only a fairly large number of them. For example, our rule might be that every member of the group has to share at least five of the seven attributes. At the same time, we might expect each attribute to be shared by at least 75% of the members of that group but we don't expect any artifact to exhibit all of the attributes. So the members of our group are going to share a substantial number of attributes, but not necessarily the same ones. So, so one, one object might be assigned to the group on the basis of the first five attributes, and the, some other one is, at, is assigned to the group on the basis of the last five attributes. So they don't always have to be the same attributes, and that's what distinguishes, distinguishes it from a classification. Now that kind of grouping is called a polythetic description. So we describe the types in terms of uh, descriptive attributes that are shared by most of the members of the group, but not all of them. Another set of approaches to grouping involves statistical analysis of a large number of attributes to see how similar or dissimilar the artifacts are. As a simple example, here we see two pottery sherds being compared on six different dichotomous attributes. The two sherds agree on three of the six attributes, leading to a similarity index of 50%, or conversely, a dissimilarity of 50%. In reality, we'd use a lot more than six attributes, and we'd have to compare every single possible pair of artifacts to see how similar or dissimilar they are. Once we've done this, we can create a table that shows all the similarities or dissimilarities among all pairs of artifacts, in this case only using seven artifacts to keep things simple. Here, for example, you'll notice that artifacts 5 and 6 are 95% similar to one another. There are many different statistical approaches that we can use to analyze these data sets, many of which are called distance measures because they try to minimize the distance or dissimilarity among all the artifacts assigned to the same group. For example, in cluster analysis, here we assign artifacts 1 and 2 to the same group because they're 90% similar or have a distance of only 10%. Then artifact 3 joins the group because it's 85% similar, meaning that it has a distance of only 15% to the average for that group. Once we've done this for all the artifacts, we then decide a cutoff, in this case 75%, that will define how many groups we have. In this case, the result is three groups, 
with Artifact 4 being the only member of its group. Yet another type of grouping is based on associations between attributes. So as with the previous method, we would measure a number of attributes on the artifacts, but in this case we try to look for associations between them. Um, does length tend to be correlated with pointedness or something like that? So we try to find uh, attributes that are correlated with each other so that when we know one attribute, we could actually kind of predict the other attribute. And some varieties of uh, grouping are based on those kinds of methods. The most obvious examples of that are ones that uh, involve things like uh, trying to source the raw materials for stone tools or pottery or whatever, where we measure chemical attributes of the artifacts, uh, such as the trace element composition of their paste or whatever, and then we can even decide on the groups graphically by plotting scatter plots to see uh, with uh, certain attributes on, one, on the x-axis and other attributes on the y-axis whether or not the points uh, tend to cluster on the space of the graph and help us define artifacts that probably came from the same source. Here we see an example of that with the x and y axes showing the ratios of different isotopes of lead in silver coins from ancient Greece. One group of coins has silver with relatively high ratios of lead 208 to lead 206. These are consistent with a source in the mines on Sifnos. Another group with different sets of isotopic ratios is likely from the mines at Lorion, not far from Athens. A number of features distinguish grouping from classification. Groups have descriptions rather than definitions. And members of groups typically share some significant number of characteristics, but not necessarily the same ones. Some kinds of grouping treat dissimilarity as a sort of distance that we try to minimize within a group, but maximize between groups. Groups don't exist outside of their members, and adding or subtracting items inevitably changes the description of the group. I hope the video you just watched helped you understand the differences between classification and grouping, and different kinds of both those things, as well as some of the methods we can use to establish classes or groups that are most useful for pursuing our research questions. I think you'll find that the establishment of categories or groups is essential for most kinds of archaeological comparisons, which often refer to things like the abundance or relative abundance of remains belonging to various categories. Categories are also extremely important for the design of digital databases, which today are the backbone of most archaeological research projects and heritage records. I'll discuss archaeological databases in my next video. You'll find much more information on both these topics in chapters 3 and 4 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, published by Springer. If you'd like to be updated as new videos become available, please click on the subscribe button below. In the meantime, thank you and stay safe.